talk is about the ecology and the geology and the biodiversity of the Sauerkraut Mountains. And they're little mountains that are separated from the Blue Ridge. When Stokes and Surrey County were one county before they split in like 1849, it was the only county in North America that had a self-contained mountain range for the Sauerkraut Mountains. Sauerkraut Mountains are named after the Sauerkraut Indians, who were, or the Sour Indians, who were a uh, Suan tribe that lived in the area. They pretty much got wiped out before, by the smallpox before people even moved in there. So before the Quakers moved into the Piedmont and before the Moravians moved in, um, so, so we're still there. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about geology. Don't get too excited. I did include planty pictures interspersed with the geology, so, so we're not gonna go too heavily into the geology. A little bit about human history, the natural communities, and then some of the biodiversity of the plants. One of the nice things you can do is go, if you ever go to a state park, you can go to North Carolina State Park has a natural resource inventory database. So here's uh, Pilot Mountain State Park, and they show that they have uh, 675 species of plants, vascular plants listed. They got uh, 177 of them historic, and 12 are questionable. But then the park went through sometime in the, in the last five years, they hired, they must have had one of their staff going in there and re-identifying, so they found 97 more. So they actually have 583 good IDs. Hanging Rock State Park started out with 719 species, 15 are historical, and 194 are questionable, and nobody has seemingly done anything for a while. So I'll pass these around, you get ideas. But every state park has this list, and I, I just pulled off the plants, but you could do the animals and whatever. So uh, like yesterday, I did a talk for the Surrey County Commissioners about the biodiversity and natural heritage of Surrey County. And you can go to NorthCarolinaBiodiversity.org and pull down for every county, in some cases, the quad, birdless, uh, dragonflies, any taxi you want, all the way down to like springtails and other little creepy little creatures. And in some cases, there's even a checklist per county. So if you want to figure out what mammals are in Guilford County, you can go to biodiversity.org and figure out what mammals are. So, you know, in Surrey County, we've got five members of the squirrel family. Who knows what they are? Gray squirrel, flying squirrel, they have the red fox squirrel, chipmunk, what's the last one? The groundhog is basically a ground squirrel. So groundhog is in the squirrel family. So those are the marks. So I did stump the Surrey County commissioners on the groundhog either. So I'll pass this around and get an idea of the plants over there. So one of the things that I was able to do was go through that list and pull out, since I did the Surrey County and Stokes County National Heritage Inventory, there's mountains there, so I know mountain plants were at the Surrey and Stokes are at the southern edge of the northern species, so we can find a lot of things that are on the mountains, but you can go through these and find, you know, species that have names like something Alleghenyensis or something Pennsylvania or Groenlandica, those are the mountain species. So we've been able to go through there. But when you go up to the Sauerkraut Mountains, the first thing you'll notice is that the Piedmont Monadnock Forest, which is dominated by chestnut oak. And the chestnut oak, used to be chestnuts too, but also chestnut oak, real gnarly bark, really not any good for logging. So when the, before the park was formed, it was owned by a company that wanted to make it a, a some kind of retreat preserve. They were planning on building a hotel and stuff up there. So they logged a bunch of it. So back in, in the uh, like 1917, you used to be able to stand anywhere in the park and see the, the horizon all the way around you before the trees grew back. And most of the trees, most of the uh, chestnut oaks, they left because they made crappy timbers that are bent and curved and hollow and whatever. So the geology of the Sauerkraut Mountains starts with the Atlantic Sea which is the predecessor to the Atlantic Ocean. So as Europe and North America came and went together, banged into each other a couple of times, that made the Appalachian Mountains, and that made the Uaris, and it made the Sauertown, and Glenorian. So the, when that Atlantic Sea opened up, about 250 million years of sediments filled that sea, beach sands and all sorts of stuff. And that all turned into 
a sedimentary rock and it was metamorphosed. Shallow water, sand and clay, slow moving, um, and then there was later on some igneous lava and magma and volcanic ash. So that all goes into pretty much everywhere in the Piedmont. Um, there's been metamorphosis. So about 850 million years ago, the tectonic plates started moving again and things started to get bent and crushed. So you wind up with sandstone becomes cork and nice, G-N-E-S-S -S -S is nice. Clay and ash become schist and, the, and they fold the strata like ripples. And if you go up to, to Pilot Mountain or Hanging Rock, a, another species that you're gonna see up there is Table Mountain Pine, Pinus pungens. It has serotonous codes that are like little hand grenades. So they only open up after fire and release their seeds. I did a, a feeding study with fox squirrels uh, when I was in graduate school with a student, and we found out that it almost takes more energy for a squirrel to open up one of these than the energy they get out of them. So that some of those cones could stay on those trees 10 years, the seeds are still viable, and then the heat of the fire softens up the pitch and opens up the cones. So table mountain pines you'll see on the edge. Uh, when I was a graduate student, working with this other graduate student, we had to collect cones to do feeding studies back at Wake Forest in the growth chamber. So we were lowering graduate students down on these little cliffs and stuff to clip off the cones, which probably violated all sorts of regulations. <laughs> so this is the rock cycle. So you start out with sedimentary rocks, a little bit of heat and pressure, they turn into metamorphic. One of the things you'll find when we go on our hike at Pilot Mountain, there are places where some of the sedimentary rocks are still like sandstone, which is only like this much more metamorphosed. Other ones get moved a lot more down, so it's really a gradient. They don't go all the way, they can be anywhere in between. And in the metamorphic rocks, they can, they can melt again when they get down and come back up as igneous lava, or the, the, the so all of the, basically the rock cycle. So they all learned this in third grade, if you forgot it, <laughs> So, Sauerkraut Mountains are an anticlinorium. An anticlinorium means curved convex up. So if you come to the north side, you see rocks going this way. If you come to the other side, you see rocks going the other way. On either side of the anticlinorium are synclinoria. That's, if you, if you imagine waves, a wave has a peak and then there's always a trough. So on both sides of the Sauerkraut Mountains, on the north side is the Valerie Dan River Basin and the Ararat Rivers, and on the south side is Germantown and the Triassic Basin, which is the closest place around here where they would want to craft for gas. Triassic basins because you got all this mud filled with organic stuff that makes gas. So you wind up with a little bit of hard quartzite that's been injected into this and it's erosion resistant. And as the land weathered away, there are estimates that where we're standing now could have been under one or two miles of sediment, and that all got eroded off, and that's now our coastal plain. Another species that I find up on the top of the mountain that's not here is the Allegheny service berry, Avalanche labus. We have Avalanche arborea down here on the Piedmont, but the labus is the mountain one. So the Tower Town Mountains now about uh, 24 to 2600 feet in elevation. That's about 1400 feet above the surrounding land. Every time you go up a thousand feet in elevation, you drop a temperature of seven and a half degrees Fahrenheit. You also, every time you go up a thousand feet in, uh, in elevation, it's like going 600 feet north in, to, in latitude. So the Sourtown Mountains are kind of like upstate New York, Pennsylvania, that area. So uh, we have a lot of the same stuff on all of our mountain monadnocks. Uh, we wind up with really thin rocky soils on the top and exposed rocks, small cracks, and caves. There's a couple of caves I know of on Flash Old Mountain, which is being on that to be added to the park. If you go in these caves, if you go up to Hanging Rock, it all looks like gray and gray sand, gray sandstone, metamorphized stuff. But in the caves, it's still sand colored. So it's beige and brown and tan, and it still looks like beach sands in the caves because it weathers in sunlight to gray. So Hanging Rock is in the east. Pilot Mountain is in the west, and the Sauertown Mountain are in between. And that looks like that. So here's the Monadnock of Pilot Mountain. Our hike will be going around the base of this. There's Sauertown Mountain, Piedmont Land Conservancy is currently working on. We've got a couple conservation easements, and we're adding a couple more on this side, because the Mountains of Sea Trail comes across the backside of Sauertown Mountain. And then there's Hanging Rock in the distance. 
And then my house is right down there. <laughs> We're about three miles away, so the, the, the uh, ravens can get, in, can get to our yard and fight with the crows. So the human history, woodland in this culture, about 10,000 years plus of minus, to about 1,500, sour Indians were the local tribal group. DeSoto and the Spanish came, among other things, being aggressive about their preaching and whatever. They spread a lot of smallpox and influenza and other diseases. So by the time other people came, you know, 100 years, most of the eastern United States was pretty wiped out of, of indigenous culture. Uh, there was also an Indian war, where the Indians warred amongst themselves for two years. Uh, William Byrd served in North Carolina Virginia Line in 1730, and he got to uh, northern Stokes County, where he saw the, the headwaters of the Mayo River. They named the Mayo River for one of the members of his team, and then he, they found Eden, and they thought that was a beautiful place, so that's where Eden, North Carolina, gets its name. We then have a colonial period that starts about 1715, and then there's the development period of the two parks. These parks were privately owned, so Haney Rock was going to be owned by a Florida company that wanted to build hotels and whatever up there. And the uh, Peak Pilot Mountain was owned by another private enterprise that had the old Ricky Boardwalk that would get people up to the top of the mountain. And you know, it was just a tourist attraction. So the parks, Haney Rock was formed in 1935. Most of the structures up there are built by the CCC. Uh, Pilot Mountain was built, built in 1968. <clears throat> This is in the Mount Airy, uh, Mount Airy Natural Heritage, Mount Airy Regional History Museum in Mount, in Mount Airy. They have a reconstruction of a Sour Indian uh, lodge. The, the Sour Indian Princess was uh, was discovered along the Dan River in the floodplain where the Sour Indians used to be, and that's in the that's downtown in, or down in Raleigh. Uh, but you know we have in in our in our North Carolina. In Stokes County, we have the Sour Indians as the mascot for the high school team, and for a long time they were like teepees and war bonnets and horses, and that's probably not what the Sour Indians were like. So another plant we find up on the top of the Monadnocks is the Mountain Holly, Elex Montana. Different from different species from the ones you find just 1,500 feet down. So this is a map, an early colonial map of North Carolina, and you can see Albemarle and uh, the Rowan River, and here's the dam. So this is the Roanoke, and the Roanoke right around here is Gaston Lake, and then the, the dam river is up in Virginia, then it's down in North Carolina, then it's up in Virginia, then it's down in North Carolina, and then it's finally up headwaters on the Blue Ridge. And these little bumps would have been the Sourtown Mountains, and these are called the Caraway Mountains, which are now the Uaris. So, so these, this is the Uari Mountains down in Randolph County, and these are the Sourtown Mountains up in uh, Stokes and Surrey. So Hanging Rock State Park found in 1936, uh, with the addition of Morris Springs land, which was a 4-H camp, it's now 8,000 acres. Pilot Mountain in 68 was just a 1,000 acre mountain, and then you've added the Ashman River section for another 3,000 acres, so they're up to about 4,000. You do find sweet birch up there. This is the one that you can scratch the leaves, scratch the leaves of the bark and get that nice sweet smell. That only occurs at about 2,500 feet in elevation. We also have it on top of Fisher Peak. It's got it on top of Laurel Mountain. I think it might get on top of Kings Mountain as well. Um, so, there, so that's one of those kind of like glacial relics left over perched on the mountaintop after the glaciers pushed everything south and then went north again. So Sourtown Mountain is the one in the middle. It's privately owned. That's where the cell towers are that broadcast our um, TV stations and the uh, NOAA weather radio. If you have a weather radio, it all comes from the Sourtown Mountain thing. Uh, there's about 15 landowners up there, part of Camp Haynes, YMC, Camp Borders, part of it. And it's connected to the two parks by the Sourtown Trail, which is now part of the Martins of Sea Trail. So it's a 22-mile trail that connects Pilot Mountain to Hanging Rock, and it crosses the backside of Sour Town Mountain. So we're talking about, here's the Mountains of Sea Trail, this is the planning map that we generated about 15 years ago. Um, and I think, so if you're coming out of, so from here, from Stone Mountain West, it's already done, because it's all been in State Park, Mandahala, Pisgah, Blue Ridge Parkway, it's all done. Then it comes to here and it's like, well, what do we do now? Well, they were originally thinking of coming down the Roaring River, but now we're thinking Elkin Creek. 
bought my answer, and he just put a parcel with the Sauer Town Mountain Trail, put a mountain sea trail on there, right on Elkin Creek, down into Elkin, because Elkin is now considering itself the trail city, and along the Yadkin River. Then from the Pilot Mountain um, River section, there's a trail maintained by the State Park up the Pilot Mountain. Across this big empty space right here, this is Sauer Town Mountain at the 4 Camp. Then you come into Hanging Rock, then you're going to come down into Danbury. And then one part of it's going to come down, follow the Dan River. Piedmont Land Conservancy is purchasing a little property right here. So we're going to swing over this way, come down, have a canoe access and a campsite for Mountain to Sea hikers uh, right in here. And then the big property that I was talking to you about that's going to be the new Forestry Education Center is right here. All of this 880 acres. And then Piedmont Land Conservancy owns the Nicron Nature Preserve, so the trail will come down east side of uh, Belouze Lake into Stokesdale and then run into uh, Summerfield and then follow the rail line from Summerfield all the way back down into town and go through Greensboro and then you don't really know. <laughs> from there. So that's kind of where we are. We're looking we're looking at this little section of these three mountains. White pine. White pine grows in northern Stokes and Surrey. Doesn't grow anywhere else further south naturally or further east. Uh, but if you take uh, dendrology at NC State, they don't even mention white pine as a tree you'll find in Wake County because it's just too hot. <clears throat> so white pine does occur naturally in Sauer Town Mountains. So the biodiversity is a function of the habitat. Steep topography is really cool because it provides you slopes. Slopes are what I look for when I do natural heritage inventories or any inventory because they're less likely to be plowed and planted and less likely to be grazed. So most of our natural stuff is still on hillsides. Everything else that's flat on the top or flat on the bottom has been manipulated. It also gives you an aspect, north, south, east, west. So north is cool and wet, south is hot and dry, east is morning sun, cool afternoons, west is afternoon sun, hot, but not as hot as south. So you wind up with aspect being a very important thing happening. Now, surprisingly, a lot of surface water, even 1,500 feet above the above top, you know, the spring is pretty close to the top of Pilot Mountain and Hanging Rock. And when you get to the top of Fisher Peak, there's springs up there that are coming out at 3,000 feet above sea level, like 1,500 feet, or in that case, 2,000 feet above the Piedmont. So lots of surface water, springs and waterfalls, rich geochemistry, or very poor soil, and you can either a choice. <coughs> the Sour Town Mountains are not like the Amphibolites. The Amphibolites, which are uh, Elk Knob, um, Hater Hill, those places that have amphiboloid soils that, rip, that weather to a high pH. The Sour Town Mountains are all kind of metamorphosed sandstone, so they're just kind of poor soils. Um, and interesting rock outcrops and elevation exposures. So all of this determines the distribution of natural communities. Natural communities, the way I define a native plant, is how they relate to natural communities. So in urban areas or other disturbed areas, in some cases, natural community doesn't apply. You can still plant native plants in your yard because it helps the benefit of pollinators and it helps the other critters, but they're really, there's really not a natural community in many urban areas. So a naturally occurring assemblage of species and the key to understanding this, those species in the landscape, we look for natural occurring communities and that allows us to understand historic impacts. So we can go out and look at logging and farming or renewing, you know, if you're in the woods and there's a lot of little straight trees and also you find a great big spreading oak, you know that that was an open pasture at one time because otherwise that big spreading oak wouldn't be there. So stuff like that. And it's the key to that is it gives you knowledge of the natural communities for conservation and ecological function. You can do one of two things. You can go to the Natural Heritage Program for the approximation of natural communities. I think we now have 115 of them in our state. Really good book by uh, Timothy Spirit's Wildflowers and Plant Communities of the Southern Appalachian Mountains and Piedmont. This one is colorful pictures and illustrations. This one is all text. So uh, those, those both are, are very handy for me. So we'll give an example of a significant natural heritage area. This is in Stokes County. Here's the Virginia line. This is the Dan River coming down through the county. Hanging Rock. Anything in red is natural, nationally significant. So we, we have something between Jessup's Mill and George's Mill, which we call the Dan River Corridor. All those little dots there are federally endangered or state listed species. 
state significance are um, the Sourtown Mountains, a couple other little places are state significant, regional, which means within a few counties surrounding where you're at are the blue line, and then green is stuff that's locally significant. So we have this for all the counties in the Piedmont that PLC works on from the Blue Ridge Parkway to down below the zoo. So this allows us to know a lot about what's supposed to be out there in the environment. Another species that you'll find only at the top of these mountains is bear oak, Quercus elisifolia. Elisifolia means it has holly-like leaves. But the cool thing is it only grows this tall. I mean, the biggest ones in the hanging rock are maybe shoulder height to me. The cool thing about this guy, this is at Pilot, this is at um, Morrow Mountain, it's at Kings Mountain. Uh, this little oak will not, it's, or acorns will not germinate if it doesn't fall on bare soil. So this is the reason for doing prescribed burns at Pilot Mountain because those acorns have to fall on sandy rock mineral soil before they'll germinate. When we first went up to Hanging Rock and we first identified this, they haven't had fires for a long time, and you could see there were no young, there were no young coming up. There were just these older ones, and you know this this tree might be a hundred years old. Unfortunately, the stems are so small, I can't get my little stem borer in there, but I'm sure that that's, that's a 100-year-old tree. We'll see some of those at Pilot Mountain on the hike. So the typical, typical Piedmont rural counties have about 10 natural community types. You know, things like dry oak hickory forests, mixed music forests, alluvial forests. So this is the top of the south facing slope. This is the lower part of the slope when you start to see uh, beech trees and red maples. And then alluvial forests are ironwood and pawpaws and uh, sycamores and river birches. So each of the state parks has an additional eight to ten natural community types, uncommon in the in the lower and uncommon natural communities host uncommon species. So some of the uncommon ones we find are the low elevation rocky summits, that's bare rock, lichen, mosses, rock cat fir, bare oak, Greenland sandwort, and raven. I put raven, I love raven. <laughs> Piedmont, uh, Piedmont oak hickory or oak, pine oak heath. So this is like table mountain pine, pitch pine, and lots of blueberry type families. So lots of axiniums and viper and um, and a few other things that all that make the pine oak. And this is usually on really steep ridges. So if you get on a, uh, if you get out to drive Sour Sourtown Mountain, you can go to the western end of Sourtown Mountain, drive there's a road that goes all the way up. And then you can see as you're driving east or you're driving west it gets narrower and narrower and narrower and pretty soon there's a fence because beyond that fence it's not dropped too wide enough to put a road that's where you find the pine low key right up that little knife edge so that's table mountain pine pitch pine irritaceous shrubs dry face exposed exposed ridges chestnut oak forests blackjack scarlet oaks and it used to be chestnuts so this is the top of hanging rock you've got table mountain pine and pitch pine in there and you would have had Greenland sandwort, lots of cool lichens, lots of mosses, salmonella, other things, except it all gets trampled by a million people that go up there and fart around. So the best place to go in, in Hanging Rock now is Flat Shoulder Mountain, because they don't really have any trails up there. So you can get up there and see what it looked like before it got trampled by a bazillion people. The Carolina Hemlock Club, uh, Hanging Rock is the only place I know of where Carolina hemlock and Canadian hemlocks are at the same place in North Carolina. Carolina hemlocks are very rare. They're like the drier, steeper sites than Canada hemlocks. They're at the kind of the top of the mountain. They're not down by the creek where the eastern hemlocks are. Eastern hemlocks are the ones that are shading trout streams that are dying because of the woolly and elgin, and that warms up the trout streams, and then the water gets there. Anyway, uh, so that's Lower Cascade Falls at Hanging Rock and the sub canopy is usually uh, Kalmia and Rhododendrons. Spray cliffs, lots of cool spray cliffs up there, near vertical rock faces, lots of cool things hang on those things, so you have mosses, liverworts, ferns, and other moisture requiring things. Most parks have a similar list of about 30 rare and 10 listed species thereabouts. So we find pale jewelweed, which is the paladin one, not the one we have with the orange flowers down here. There are a couple places on Hanging Rock that get the two together. Uh, we have the Carolina Spring Beauty. This is the one with the broader leaves. It's a northern mountain, northern and mountain species. So it's up on top of Hanging Rock. And the Cliff Saxifrage, 
is up on the top of the mountain on, on some of those spray tours. Animal diversity, we've got a lot of cool animals. We've got ravens, vultures, and occasionally peregrine falcons, but the ravens and the vultures are there first to get the prime nesting sites, and usually the peregrines show up later and they don't have a good nesting site. So we only get peregrines on and off occasionally, uh, but, but, but we have ravens and vultures all the time. Cracks and crevice dwellers, snakes, small and large mammals, and lots of salamanders. North Carolina is a center for biodiversity of salamanders and also for freshwater mussels. So there was there's one called Whirly Salamander. It was known from back in the 1820s that there was a rare salamander up there. And it said, any rock, pop, pop, any rock. These guys were up there crawling around. We were looking all over the top of the mountain, couldn't find it. And then we were down by the Dan River, and one of the guys from NC State pulled a cooler out of his car and almost set it on one because it was actually at the base of Hanging Rock Mountain in a little mossy area. So we now know where there's a couple places on the top of Fisher Peak and a couple places on the top of Saddle Mountain where we might be able to go out on a misty February, March day and find like 15 or 20 species of salamanders at night. You know, put on your red headlamp, walk out in the rain. Um, so we have a lot of cool stuff. We've got a lot of seasonal migrants, hawks, tropical birds, and butterflies. A lot of things like hilltop birds and butterflies fly and a lot of other insects. So the tops of those mountains are good places to go to look for seasonal migrants of things. Here's the ravens, Corvus corax. Uh, they look like giant crows. Uh, very, very interesting birds. We hear them in our yard. They make the croaking sound instead of the cawing sound, and really. We're three miles away from Hanging Rock as the Corbin flies. Resource management. Historically, a lot of people did the leave it alone. Well, the leave it alone is okay, except you get invasive species, climate change, lack of fire, and pollution. Aside from both parks now have, um, they're just both breaking a million visitors a year. So a lot of people are coming into the Pilot Mountain and Hanging Rock State Park. So that brings in a lot of stuff, so you can't really do leave it alone. So a better understanding of the ecological processes means that we should now achieve better goals of management, that includes prescribed fire, that includes invasive species management. Um, there's an entire ranger at Pilot Mountain State Park whose full-time job is invasive species man management. He and I are constantly going back and forth about what kind of herbicides to use, what kind of hand holding to use, what kind of other things to use. So, uh, he's doing a great job up, up there. Um, and a lot of forest management. There are places, the state park is now, as you add land to the state park, often you add land that had somebody's Wabba Wally Pine Plantation. Well, you know, we'd like to kind of get rid of that and let nature come back with what we want. So when the, when the Land Conservancy adds lands to Bay River State Park, they ask, the staff there actually asks us to clear out those pine plantations because if they if, if once it goes to state park it's almost impossible for them to get a permission to do that and then when you log it all the funds go back to the general general fund so it doesn't really do them any good so we like to probably take care of some of those things so these are two other things we find on the mountain the american lily of the valley Cumbria, montana and what's now called bear corn weekly decided that we should not all use squaw anymore or the pejorative squawk. Just like nowadays, I just was reading, the gypsy moth is now called the spongy moth because people of Romani descent objected to the gypsy moth name. So the scientific name are still the same, but we're now called this bear corn. We saw a lot of this in the Smokies this spring when we were last spring when we were out there, um, and it's at the top of uh, Pilot and Hanging Rock as well. So prescribed fire is a useful tool. Uh, lack of fire suppression leads to undesirable changes in the forest landscape, decline of fire tolerant species, increase in non-native species, and increase in fuel loads, which means things get really hard to handle when you have all the fuel. My biggest concern as an ecologist in the future of climate change is if we ever get five years of drought in a row, like they've had in the West, we've got tons of fuel out there. And I talked to the county commissioners yesterday, and they were bringing up. After these like weeks of 95 degree weather, you see a dead oak here, a dead pine there, and just can't suck up enough water to keep themselves going. And you, I, I see a lot of plant, a lot of mature trees dying in the summer because of that. 
and, and that would be my biggest concern. So the, the tendency toward catastrophic wildfires usually comes from this fuel load, and there's a lot of ecological and social consequences. So primer in pre prescribed fire. So to notice the wind is blowing that way. So we go over here to some natural fire break, start a fire that creeps against the wind flow, and then you can come back this way and light fires that then run into this. And when they all get together, then the whole thing puts out the smoke. When, when we do prescribe fires, a lot of it is learning how to light fires so that when they don't get too big and too wild before they run into the burned out parts of something else. So that's that prescribed fire is uh, learning how to light and how to burn and learning how to control the smoke from your burn so it goes somewhere or it's not going into schools and nursing homes and people's houses. So both Pile Mountain and Hanging Rock have thousands of acres that would benefit from low intensity frequent fire. A good example of that is Thurman Chapman Game Land in Wilkes County. If you've not been up there, the Wildlife Commission has been burning that for 20 years. And they burn it so much, and it's amazing what comes up in the seed bank. Lacris, lots of solid agos, lots of native grasses. They don't really plant a whole lot of stuff. They've just been burning it enough that stuff that keeps the weeds down, opens up the canopy, and they have a really cool, it's a really cool place to visit with a lot of good, interesting stuff. It's right up near Stone Mountain State Park. However, due to topography, burning is difficult on places with slopes. You never would start a fire at the bottom of a slope because it chimneys and goes haywire. You start at the top and then you creep down the hill. Stuff like that you have to learn the hard way sometimes. In November 2012, there was a 100 acre fire prescribed and it got loose and it burned 700 acres. It looked terrible on the news because Pilot Mountain sticks up there, everybody can see it. You wind up having this big smoky volcano looking thing, but it was really a good thing. I think only seven of that 700 acres, only three acres of it got off of our property on the stump paper. Didn't burn up anything. It was perfect. Every time there's a fire now at Pilot Mountain, they're going to let it burn to the to the, uh, the fire control line at the bottom. So every fire from now on is going to be 1,079 acres because they're just going to let it burn. Uh, Bradley Spleenwort. When I'm Bradley I will see this at Pilot Mountain State Park growing out of the cracks and crevices. It's a, it's a listed rare fern. And hairy alum root, Cucurbillosa. So this is in the coral root family, or um, um, it's in the Bucra family, which we have a lot of coral, coral bells. Yeah, we have a lot of cultivated coral bells. Uh, but there's a couple of mountain species that grow there, and we will see both of these at Pilot Mountain. Um, We'll also see, we could see if we got to the top, the Greenland sandwort, Minuarta Greenlandica. This was probably something that came down with the glacier, the glacier receded, and these things are stuck on the top of the mountain. And then we'll see silverling, Paranicia. Uh, there's another kind called silverling, which is the big Bacchus, uh, the Bacchus hemifolia. So this is a little silverling. Both of these things are like three inches tall. So the future of Town Mountains, all three peaks continue to be islands of natural significance in an increasingly developed Piedmont. Uh, at some point, I usually show a video showing the, the corridor from Charlotte up to Greensboro, Winston Salem, and Raleigh, and it's just more and more development around that Carolina Crescent. And luckily, they're north of it, and then the Uaris is south of it. So the Uaris have been, always been thought of North Carolina Central Park because the curve goes around it, and then this is the northern part of that, which is, I like living in Stokes County because except for one little corner of the county, we don't have any freeways. So it's all curvy mountain roads, so there's really not a lot of development pressure up there. Um, more people are attracted to them for recreation, both parks are about a million. Uh, we, which is Piedmont Land Conservancy, the Conservation Fund, uh, a couple other the state park people are continually adding park parcels to both uh, both parks and to protect some of the Sourtown Mountain. And we will continue to survey, explore, and do research. This is kind of what they're going to look like. But a lot of our Piedmont Land Conservancy places are going to be little places like this. And, you know, it's going to be me and Ken Carr and a few other people kind of in speed barns. We'll all be hanging around in the last trees uh, that are out there. Um, Beet hazelnut occurs on the top of these. These are the normal hazelnuts of uh, the, you know, filberts, hazelnut filberts. But the ones on the mountains have these interesting little projections. The, the nut is formed 
in two little hands. And the ones we find down here are just two little hands. So, well, these are two little hands with a couple of fingers sticking up. <laughs> but the bean table. Not. My favorite plant of the mountain is sweet fern, Tontonia peregrina. Not actually related to sweet fern, but more related to wax myrtle. And I don't know how many times the botanist can be can stand it. I've dug up this thing dozens of times, tried to bring it down to the Piedmont, it limps along for a little while and then croaks. It just can't make it. But if we go up to, if we take a hike up to Fisher Peak, this is all over Fisher Peak. Uh, and it's related to wax myrtle and it's got a really nice fragrance. So when we go up to Fisher Peak, we do like a scratch and sniff tour where I take the sweet birch and the uh, uh, sassafras up there and the Sweet fern, all of those are things. Once you've smelled them once, you'll never forget them. Your oral, your sense of smell is really interesting. At Pollen Mountain, we've got the feather bush Andromeda, Perseus floribunda, right on the right on the path, right by the 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 knob, the Milet knob trail, and that's the farthest south and far, lowest in elevation that we know that occur. Every nursery man in North Carolina and South Carolina would love to get cuttings off of this plant, thinking that it has some genetics to survive in a more Piedmont condition, because otherwise they're at four and 5,000 feet in the Balsam Mountains, and they're really doing great up in like upstate New York and Pennsylvania. So this is kind of, so we'll, we'll see this on the hike. Um, it's one of those ones that, you know, Mark Rose, you showed it to me one time, he was talking about, he was actually drooling. It was really, it was, it was like embarrassing to see it. So, so one time or another, like uh, about 15 years ago, I did a sediment study for the Dan River. Um, we all know sediment is a big problem in all of our watersheds. Hardly anybody manages for it, and people don't, don't monitor for it. So, you know, like our county commissioners probably don't want to monitor for it because they have to do something about it. <laughs> so we said all of these are watersheds and where this, so this is like, that's all one contained watershed. We put a suspended sediment monitor. These were like 10 bottles, five, 500 milliliter bottles that have a little curve thing that allow a siphon action to happen. And as what happens when it rains around here, big thunderstorms, they're always in the afternoon. And then the water goes up at night, and by the next morning it's down, and you don't even know what happened. But these things fill up, and then you, so you can collect. So this creek right here is Indian Creek, which is part of Hanging Rock. It's the best Piedmont water quality in the Piedmont because all of its watershed is in the park, and most of the parks, like campgrounds and the beach and all that kind of stuff, is all over here. So Indian Creek is a pretty nice watershed. So when you collect samples. So this is the next nearest water basin, the same storm. So this is a, an agricultural and, re and residential creek. Each one of these represents 10 inches of water raised. So you've got the water went up in that storm 50 inches and then went down. The next morning when you're out there collecting, it looks like that. So this and that, you would never tell. But it turns out this, so the, uh, it, during the, uh, whatever the storm was, during the storm, the water level in a fully wooded watershed only went up 30 inches compared to 50 inches in a disturbed watershed. And look at how clean it is. You can almost drink this. So it turned out it's a really good um, reference reach to use for stream restoration and other things. So we've done a lot of work on Indian Creek, great benthic macroinvertebrates in there. So this is the flowering stuff. Um, white witch alder, Father Gilla. Got that, that all of the Sour Town Mountains. Um, we've got the Tupperwood and Edmund up there pretty rapidly. It's one of the things that this is one of your fire intolerant species. So when you do prescribe fire, you tend to knock this one back, which turns out to be a good thing. I mean, I'm a botanist, I like going out in the woods doing stuff, but when I get into one of those rhododendron thickets, I wish I had a bulldozer or a machete or a flamethrower or something that's really hard come through there. So there's a lot more Catawba rhododendron than there should be. Um, and squirrel corn, uh, dicentra, this is also a mountain species. Notice it says Canadense. That's a clue that it's probably not the normal Piedmont one. Because we get the Dutchman bridges down in the Piedmont. We don't get the squirrel corn. That's a northern mountain species. So the Piedmont Land Conservancy does four things. Natural heritage, watershed preservation, local farmland. We now got, I think we've got 
89 farms with conservation easements, all small family farms. The idea is eventually the transportation, well, the Central Valley of California will eventually run out of water at some point, and the energy and whatever it takes to bring things to us out of season will probably, so we'd like to have local farms. And in urban screen space, this includes the Mountain Sea Trail and regular little small parks. You're currently at about 265 projects. That's about 30,000 acres. So here you see, um, so this is this is Hanging Rock, and then this is Sour Town. We've got one project here. We're going to have another one on the back side, and one on this end, and then the 4-H camp is down here, and we're going to add some conservation easement around the 4-H camp. And then here's Pilot Mountain and its mountain river section. And this is uh, Elkin Creek, or this is the Mitchell River going up to this is Fisher Peak. So Fisher Peak is a mountain that's attached to the Blue Ridge, and it goes up to 3,300. So it's another uh, thousand feet higher than, this, than these. Uh, and then we have a couple. This is the Elkin Creek right here. So this is Wells now. We just put this easement on part of the Mountain to Sea Trail uh, just in December. So all of these, the green areas are our focus areas. So there's like an ag, this is Hall River State Park. Here's an agricultural farming corridor. Here's a farming area. Uh, this is all the stuff around Car Camp Caraway, um, Mount Shepherd, Bridges Mountain. So these are all that, we're hoping to do like 2,000 acres of conservation all where all these church camps are between Asheboro and Lexington. And then that's, uh, that's still not right. So we also have gentians, the closed gentian, bottled gentian is up at Hanging Rock. You see that in the fall, that's a nice fall moving one. Allegheny stone crop. This is only this, you can find this at Hanging Rock and you can find it at Pop Mountain, but only where the people will go. This one's really sensitive to disturbance and I think people pick it and fiddle around with it. And then buffalo nut, which we saw up in the Smokies, well it's up on, the, on these mountains as well, part of area crew growth. This is what Piedmont Land Conservancy is all about, our other infrastructure. Where the uh, county commissioners last night were rolling their eyes because they're all into everything about like broadband and roads and shopping rents. And I'm talking about scenery and water quality and topsoil and species and old growth and other stuff. And it's like, I don't think they did it. All I can do is find the seed. I always mention the first prerequisite of intelligent tinkering is to save all the pieces. That's what all the people. He was talking about watch repair. And then when I grew up, the first cars I had, I bought Jumpsburg cars when I was in high school, and now I used to do carburetor repair. You get the carburetor in the building kit, and it'd be sprayed with steel balls and shit, and you pour it out of the kitchen table, and you take it apart and replace it. There was always extra stuff. <laughs> well, you have to save that stuff, because you put it out of the car, and you realize it doesn't idle, or it doesn't do something, and you got to take it all apart again. So, I don't know what the modern version of that is, because kids don't do that anymore. So, it must be some software version of that that I have to think about. But, or a jigsaw puzzle. Or a jigsaw puzzle. Well, I do mention to people that, you know, since 1970, when I was in high school, to 2010, 60% of the animal life on Earth has disappeared. Mm -hmm. Not species, but 60% of the elephants, 60% of the ch chimps, 60% of the African lions, whatever. And then people were saying, that can't be right, whatever. They published, it was the World Wildlife Fund and the London Zoo did this big nice stuff. So they said, well, we'll go back and we'll redo the study. And then they published it again last year, and they corrected whatever the people thought were errors, and now it's 69% of people have lost in that. So that's in our lifetime, 60% of the animal life on Earth has disappeared. Some of that should be concerning to people. So the Piedmont Land Conservancy is all about saving those pieces. Last year was the 60th anniversary of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. That kind of got people thinking about the environment and about species. And when I do my biodiversity talk, which I'm going to be doing one in February 16th at CICA in uh, Winston-Salem, we do the, do the biodiversity of, of Forsyth County, which is pretty similar to all of Piedmont. Um, and you'll, you'll find that, you know, we're, we're losing 30% of our marine mammals are endangered, uh, 30 or 40% of the reef forming animals, animals are endangered, um, lots of other critters we've lost. 26% of the birds in North America, which is what, 3 billion birds that don't make it to North America anymore in the same 40 year time period. We don't know how many species of insects we lost because not many people have done good surveys. 
but I know I can drive home to Stokes County and my windshield won't be splattered with bugs. When I was a kid, you could drive around at night, but you had to clean your radiator and clean your, I just grew up on the shores of Lake Erie and there used to be such a uh, uh, mayfly thing. But there actually are people in Northern Ohio who specialize in cleaning out radiators from mayfly bugs just during that one month. So, and apparently that doesn't happen very much in here, so that concerns me. So thank you for your interest in local native plants. Are there any questions? So this is me on the top of Fisher Peak. So these, this is Mitchell River Game Lands. Uh, this is um, uh, the Brushy Mountains. So from here, you can, on the top of Fisher Peak, you can see Grandfather and Mitchell, Mount Mitchell, this time of year. Um, there's lots of cool stuff that grows along all these rock outcrops, and then a lot of this is, uh, this is Surrey County down below here. So you're you're right on the mountain, right behind you is the Blue Ridge Music Center. Can you back up the slides for your contact information? Can you back up my slides? Sure. Thank you, sir. It's just a flip. I put my this is my cell phone. If you go online to Piedmont Land Conservancy, you'll see there's an office number there. I'm not very honest. So don't even try. So my that's my cell phone. And Ken Bridal Piedmontland.org is the best email for me. Yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit about the fire that happened on Fire Mountain this past year? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> what else do you want to know? Um, the, 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 the first fire that got out of control was because there was the first fire and there was a whole lot more fuel. Now the fuel loads have been knocked down, and it's really all you're burning is two or three years worth of leaf litter and, and a little bit of pine. And the, you know, that big smoky fire that really looked dramatic in the news, it didn't burn anything above knee high. So when, when you go up the pile of mountain, you'll see fire scars. We look at fire scars. After we do a prescribed fire, we want to know how high the, high the fire scars burn. That tells you how hot the fire was. If I'm burning the branches off of a lobolly pine that's 20 feet high, that's probably too hot. So we want to keep them low, and that's the idea of prescribed fire. You do it when the, when the temperature is such, you don't usually do prescribed fire in them. In, they usually do it in the springtime when it's cooler and a little bit moister. But in the summertime is when you get wildfires, and nowadays they're just going to let them burn to the fire line that they constructed after that first big fire. Was that a wildfire? Or? That was a wildfire, yeah. We had a wildfire on the Sourtown Mountains above, um, at, the, at the western end, above the YMCA camp. So I told people who had a, a campfire there and they didn't put it out. And this is like October. Well, leaves are falling, put your fire out. Spray water on it, dig it up, whatever. Don't just leave it in the middle of autumn. And that was a hard one because because it's private property up there, they rush in and they try to do put it out. Well, then they put out the fire and then the next day leaf fall fell and it all started all kept going like that. So what they really need to do is, you know, protect the houses that are up there. There is a, 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 a U.S. Forest Service uh, plan called Firewind, and it basically, you know, once they started to put mailboxes, when I first moved up to Stokes County, it was just P.O. boxes, and a lot of people had, didn't have street addresses, and you'd see a little track that went into the woods, and you thought, oh, it's just a little fire work. Well, then they said you got to put mailboxes so the EMS people can't find can find it. Well, then you realize there's five or ten people living back in the woods there, so it's a big deal to, to do fire protection mainly because it's protecting a lot of people who live in the woods. And we know in California, in Colorado, and other places, people probably shouldn't be living in those woods. Those, those woods are a lot more flammable and a lot drier. And then we have a big problem in the West. We've got uh, yellow star grass and a couple of other invasive grasses that actually colonize fire lanes. So, you know, the, you come through here and you take your tiller and you clear a wood and then you come back and you find this nice fluffy grass and when they get weather like they're having now, you know, the, the atmospheric river dumping water, that's going to make all kinds of stuff grow and then as soon as it gets hot and dry, you need wildfire season. So my, my sister lives in California and they have uh, three seasons. It's snow, it's, it's rain, it's mudslides, and it's fire season. That's California's weather. So, so the, the, the Fire at Pilot Mountain is really good because the Table Mountain Pine, the Bear Oak, um, the uh, Pitch Pine, 
all of those of all fire tolerant species and we want to get those back to being in the in the majority and dominance we want to get we want to cut back the, the calmia and the rhododendrons so that there's other things that come up with stuff on the ground that won't grow on the rhododendrons so it was actually a pretty good part it's unfortunate you know you think you listen to the news 700 acres of pilot mountain has been destroyed you think shit 700 acres is like gone. Well, no, it's just burned and it'll be fine. And by the next, two, by two springs, it's better. Yes. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, Tall Timbers research? Uh, I am. I am. In South Georgia. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and they did a lot of fire management. They did a lot of fire management. And Julie there's Moore, a, there's a facility right next to it called Birdsong. Yeah. And I was on the board for Birdsong. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, they merged now. If we, if, if we want to do the amount of long leaf pine restoration that we need to do to get from 1% where we are now back up to some reasonable amount of long leaf pine, we need to do more burning. Julie Moore, who led our outing in the Sand Hills, she was on the staff at Tall Timbers for years before she went and did policy work up in Manning, up in uh, Washington, and now she's in back retired back in Raleigh. Um, and she, so the, yeah, the Tall Timbers, when I was on the when I was the president of the Prescribed Fire Council, we had a lot of people who were familiar with tall timbers. And when every time they have a long leaf pine, uh, there's, a, there's a group that's doing long leaf pine uh, restoration all around the military bases because you can get uh, something called Stevens money to do prescribed burning on, on private property all around Fort Bragg and John Seymour Johnson because those places do live fire stuff. So Seymour, Fort Bragg sets off, they set off like hundreds of wildfires a year. They didn't prescribe burning, it was get out of hand. You know, it burned up all those tattoo parlors and pawn shops that surround the base, you know? So, um, yeah, so the Paul Tempers is a great is a great place. All that stuff from the Florida Panhandle. And then east of here, that's where you find a lot of places in the in the Long Beach Pine where there's a lot of big game land, people doing quail stuff. You need that wire grass under the Long Beach Pine in order to do the biodiversity to keep those critters happy. So, May 11th, 10 o'clock, we're going to meet at the top of Pilot Mountain State Park, at the top parking lot, and there's a, there's a uh, interpretable, interpretive panel there. There's also restrooms, which is handy. It's always handy to have restrooms. Um, and there probably is some online registration will be going. So we're basically just going to do the pilot non trail and we'll see the Prince of Florabunda, we'll see the Silver Thing, we might see the Greenland Sand Wharf, we'll see the Bear Oak, um, we'll see the Fucra, a couple other species, all in that little hike around. It's pretty mild, I mean, it's an easy, easy hike. And then everywhere you're looking, you can see places where that fire came right up and scorched things right up to the top of the knob, and then you go around the corner and not so much burn. So the nice thing about the fire, is it's also patchy. One of our problems with a lot of our landscapes is it's a lot of even closed aged forest. So we'd like to be more patchy. And prescribed park helps you do 